Hi, my name is Michael Lawton. I'm president and CEO of Barrow Neurological Institute. I'm chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Michael Lawton, President and CEO of Barrow Neurological Institute and the Chair of Department of Neurosurgery. He has experience in treating more than 4,000 brain aneurysms, 875 AVMs, and other highly delicate areas of the brain. He's a member of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, Congress of Neurological Surgeons, Society of Neurological Surgeons, American Academy of Neurological Surgery, and World Academy of Neurological Surgery. His clinical research studies the anatomy of microsurgical approaches and clinical outcomes of microsurgery for aneurysms. AVMs, and bypass surgery. He has published over 450 peer-reviewed articles, three single-author textbooks, and over 70 book chapters. Co-founded Mission Brain, a teaching mission to raise the level of neurosurgery practice in developing countries that conducts annual missions in Mexico and Asia. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Michael Lawton, President, CEO, and Chair of Neurosurgery at Neurological Institute. Doc, how are we doing today? We're doing great. How are you doing? Doing good. Thank you for being with us. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change during your fellowship? Yeah. Um, so, um, as a resident, I think the goal is always to just become the best neurosurgeon you can possibly be. To try and um, get the most out of your training experience. It's seven years, which um, for most people seems like an eternity, but. Um, when you think about all that has to happen in those seven years, you go from being a professional student who's been in school for basically decades uh, to actually transitioning to be a, a caring surgeon who is competent to do some of the most difficult uh, brain operations that there are to be done. And so um, it's all about training. It's all about um, trying to get the best experience, the most experience, um, the exposure to the masters, people who will mentor you. Um, I kind of viewed that seven year period as just my being a sponge and trying to soak up absolutely as much as I possibly could. And that, that was the focus. It was just all about um, how many cases I could do, the, the challenging uh, level of the cases, what kind of autonomy, what skills would I be able to find in myself and develop in myself over those years. And that's what I was focused on. Now, taking us through your fellowship, what was your mentality heading into your first job search, and how did that perspective change in the beginning years of your career? Yeah, the um, the job search is interesting. Like for me, it was a very simple story. I uh, knew that I wanted to be a vascular neurosurgeon. Um, there aren't a lot of those jobs in this country to begin with, so you end up um, really scrapping your way and trying to find anything, any morsel of a job. Uh, that's out there. And in, in my year, um, there I wasn't finding anything really. I looked at one job in New Mexico uh, that was very light on case volume and not necessarily in a place that um, I wanted to be. And then I was looking in Los Angeles at a job doing acoustic neuromas rather than vascular, which is what I wanted. And those were really the only two things that I was finding all the way through three quarters of that, that last year of my training. And then uh, my opportunity opened up in the very last minute, the 11th hour. I had a, a great interview. I was given an offer and I immediately took it in San Francisco. And so it's, um, I view it as serendipity. You know, you try and put yourself um, in the right place at the right time. And in the end, it's a lot of um, luck, good or bad. And um, fortunately for me, it was good luck. And I uh, landed in a wonderful job that um, I occupied for 20 years. Can you kind of briefly take us through your journey on how you ended up being the president CEO over at Barrow? I was um, a trainee here at Barrow back in the 90s. So um, the, the person who was running Barrow, Robert Spessler, uh, trained me. I was one of his uh, uh, residents. Um, I um, was one of his disciples, if you will. And, and so um, uh, I think um, um, when I left Barrow, I, I wanted to become like he was, and um, he had trained me, uh, my techniques were the same, I thought processes were similar, and, and so um, my uh, journey was about trying to um, reach the same level of proficiency that, um, that my mentor had shown me, and, um, and I, uh, that was my goal, I just wanted to reach that same level, and I, I think um, over the years I got there, um, who knows when it happened, but I think I just got there, and um, um, uh, when the time came for him to 
uh, step aside and uh, find a replacement, then um, you know he he reached out, and um, and so it was a natural thing for me to um, take that challenge from the person who trained you know, who, who trained me, and to return to the place where I trained. Uh, it was sort of a nice um, full circle harmony that um, felt right. Throughout your career, did you ever consider going private practice, or were you academic focused all the way? Academic focused all the way. Um, I um, have always uh, felt like you know we're on this earth to make a difference, to make some mark on the world, and you make your contributions um, in a bigger way in academics because you're still taking care of the patients who need you, but you're also um, you're, you're making that contribution whether it's through discovering. Uh, new science, uh, whether it's through inventing new procedures or devices. Um, I, I've always felt that the academic mission was um, the most important mission. Private practice um, can sometimes devolve into um, just taking care of patients and making money. And um, uh, it's not a knock on either one of those things, but um, I, I felt like I wanted to do those and more and have that contribution uh, that was part of the academic mission. So I, I've always, um, written papers. I've always looked to be a contributor, to be at meetings, to have a voice. Um, to me, that's what academics is about. And so um, the beauty of that philosophy is that if you are making contributions and um, uh, then the rest comes, you know, if you, if you're a contributor and um, are doing innovative work, then the patients will come to you. It's uh, uh, you, you, um, you, 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 get the benefits of the private practice uh, situation through successful academics because patients will seek you out if you're doing quality work. What were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed to the top of your industry? Um, I think uh, the keys are mentorship. Uh, uh, mentorship is really important. Um, I talked about Dr. Spetzer just showing me the way, but also when I was in San Francisco, I had a mentor in Dr. Berger who um, really supported me. Um, I was sticking my neck out, doing tough cases, um, trying some challenging new things. And um, you need to be in an environment when you're doing that kind of work where if things don't always go to plan that you've got the support of the person who's, uh, who's leading that organization. And I did. Um, uh, Dr. Berger and the, the UCSF uh, team was very supportive. We had a structure there where um, I could do my subspecialty and be really focused on um, a particular sliver of the neurosurgical pie. And, um, and that really helped um, me advance. And um, that was big. Um, I also think um, just um, having a real clear vision in your mind about where you want to go. Like I, I um, wanted to be creative. I wanted to push uh, boundaries a bit and uh, really see how far I could uh, take certain things in my practice, whether it was um, tough new bypasses or bigger, more difficult AVMs or deeper aneurysms. I mean, these were the things that um, I personally wanted to try and push. And, uh, um, and I think that, um, I think for the listeners, it takes a sort of uh, clear idea of where you're trying to get to, to actually reach that. What advice do you have for the graduating residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? Um, it's a tough market. Um, I think um, the, uh, the, there are a lot of really good qualified residents who finish training every year looking for jobs. Um, there are not, not always uh, enough jobs to go around. I think um, the best advice is to just always work hard um, every step of the way to build yourself up. Um, it's easy to kind of um, coast through residency and not write papers or not do research and do the thing, not do the things that would help improve your candidacy for that first job. But if, if on the other hand, you are constantly looking to, to um, improve your record and um, get yourself ready for that leap into the job market, then when the day actually comes, you will have prepared well for it. And, you know, you can, um, have something to say. Um, when you make that job journey, you have to get out there and you have to present a story, you know, who you are, what you've done, where you want to take it. And um, that story takes years to write. So I think you have to start writing very early and really craft it. With all these annual conferences being done virtually now, 
What advice do you have for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreaching process? The, um, the virtual meeting um, world is really interesting. Um, and it's, uh, it's new, so we're all trying to figure it out. But um, it's hard. You, you can't network um, at a virtual meeting. All you can do is, is see a panel of faces. And um, at meetings, it's different. You can give a talk. Um, you can present some of your work as a resident. And then people can come up to you afterwards and ask questions. Or uh, you might notice. Uh, uh, a program chair in the audience who is interested and you can approach that person and, and uh, ask them what they thought of your talk. I mean, that's the kind of networking that can happen in real time when you have real meetings. Uh, in virtual meetings, you don't get that. And um, so I, I think the advice is um, really more about, you know, if you have opportunities to be part of these meetings um, and submit abstracts to do it. I, I have residents who say, well, it's only going to be a virtual meeting, so should I even bother to submit the abstract and present at it? And I think the answer is yes. You never know who's in the audience. You never know who you'll connect with. And sometimes um, if, um, if that person happens to be in the audience who could have an impact on your future, it's worth having done that. So um, I, I would encourage the residents to continue to um, participate in these meetings and give, put your best foot forward, give it your best shot. Through your experience working with some of the top residents and fellows, what do you see young surgeons making as far as biggest mistakes entering the job market? I think some of the biggest mistakes that people make is um, they're too focused on either the money or the, um, what I'll call the accoutrements. You know, like if you, um, if you focus on money and accoutrements, like where you're living, what kind of house you can afford and so on, then um, sometimes you make decisions that aren't the best for your academic success. And I think um, in the early years, it's all about um, the academic success. It's about going through those personal learning curves and developing into an independent surgeon. It's about um, having the um, ability to produce some science or make some contribution through your work. Um, those are the things that allow you to step stone your way up the ladder. And if you're too worried about um, uh, the salary or the city that you're living in uh, and you sacrifice the, uh, the quality of the experience that you might have or the opportunity you might have, then um, you won't get as far. I think um, it's more important to just um, take the best opportunity and if it's not the right city or you're um, worried about other factors, just put those on hold and step stone your way up to a better position later. Now, seeing that there's a human element to being a surgeon and through all your experiences, what advice would you have given your younger self when dealing with complications or not ideal situations in cases in the OR? Yeah, uh, I think how you process complications is so critical. Like, um, I've seen really talented surgeons who are not very good at processing complications. And um, what happens is it's, they get, they get um, scared. They get fearful in the operating room and it affects them. Um, they don't take chances. Um, they don't develop uh, to their fullest. Um, it, it limits them in what they're able to become. And I, I think that um, ability to um, balance success and failure, to reach a little bit uh, further than your grasp and being willing to, um, to learn and grow and, and um, process the experience, that, that's a really critical part of life. And um, uh, I don't know that I can give you any pithy advice as to how to learn to do that, but I think um, somehow you have to learn that that's part of kind of growing up in this business. Um, not every quarterback steps on the field and throws uh, spiral perfect passes and touchdowns uh, in their first uh, season. You know, there, there's a lot of interceptions and sacks and what have you. Um, that's just part of the game. And I think um, it's true in football. It's true in neurosurgery. It's true in life. You just have to find ways to, um, to get through that and to be stronger as a result of it. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.